Okay, welcome to the first kind of official episode of Flying High with Flutter. I'm here with Arimas, who is a very well well known, at least I, I can see on LinkedIn every time I hop on there, uh, Flutter expert. And we had a discussion a couple, at least a month ago, I think, about uh, yeah Firebase and how you how you can use it properly. And so I kind of wanted to follow up with that. And uh, yeah, so. But I think first off, let's go ahead and let's just kind of, you know, give us an introduction about who you are and what you do and the whole spiel. <laughs> All right. Yeah, really, really appreciate uh, having me here, Alan. Um, so yeah, let's let's start about myself. Um, so I'm originally from Lithuania. Uh, I left Lithuania after straight after high school. So I was studying in in, in Denmark. <clears throat> uh, after graduation, I was working in in, in, in Netherlands. I was working in China, in Hong Kong. Uh, currently, I'm in Vietnam. Uh, mostly within the last 10 years, I've been in, in tech and covering mobile, so mobile user experience. And then I more switched into uh, end to end development as well. I had a couple of my own startups. Uh, I was also for a couple of years in management position, so project uh, product management. Uh, and recently, I'm focusing on uh, MVP and POC development, so minimum viable product and or proof of concept. Um, and yes, for mobile, I started with Android, and within last three years, I've been focusing more on Flutter. So yeah, that's me. Yeah, how come you keep moving around? Because I I'm also in Hong Kong, or I, well, you were here before. You were here for some time and then you kind of took off. So what, how do you know when it's time to move yeah. and how do you know where to move next? Yeah, so it was it was very funny. Um, it's really, you know, like my, my this whole country dropping. It's it's very, very interesting. So Netherlands, yeah, it was my first job. And then uh, I, I had internship in China and I knew I want to get back to Asia. It was my first time in Asia and particularly China. And after, after um, my first job, I, I decided to just move to China and I moved to Shanghai. I was working there. Um, unfortunately, my startup uh, where, where I worked um, uh, got bankrupt. Uh, and I went to Hong Kong to, to get new visa, right? And when I was in Hong Kong, I just quickly checked you no know, jobs. And I saw, you know, some, some Android developers were needed. And I was like, yeah, why not? Let's apply. And I applied and actually I got accepted. So I pretty much stayed in Hong Kong. And when I was staying in Hong Kong, uh, at one point I was like, okay, I have these management skills, I have development skills. I've, I, I've been working with big teams. I should be able to understand, you know, how startups working because I've, I've been working in startups before. And I had this mm. uh, problem I was facing myself with rentals and I decided to launch my own startup. And it was just uh, with the startup. It was just very unfortunate um, time because a couple months after I launched, the protests in Hong Kong started. Unfortunately, so the whole rental market, you know, didn't go that well. And after that, I met a couple really, really talented people, and I was like, yeah, let's let's do another startup and let's do uh, travel uh, because it, it was initially their idea, and I really liked it. So that one was called Flunky. And uh, the first one was called Rent Me. The second one, uh, Travel, is called Flunky. And yeah, we started to work on this on uh, September, uh, 2019 mm -hmm. September. And yeah, from around February, COVID started. All right. So it just, you know, <laughs> this, this whole timeline, just such a mess. And in Hong Kong, it's just very expensive um, to live especially if you have your own startup. So I, I just decided, okay, I need to move somewhere else because w when I was running Grand Me, it's, it's kind of depressing, you know, staying in small flat, working 16 hours a day. It's, it's really, you know, feeling super cramped and paying such a big amount of money for that. So I decided I want to move somewhere else. Uh, so I just went back to, to Lithuania to my parents for, for a couple of months because I haven't seen them for a while. And after that, I, I was just thinking, okay, I want to go to Vietnam or I want to go to Indonesia or Thailand because it's much cheaper and it's still close to Hong Kong if I need to go back, right? 
And in the end, I just selected Vietnam and uh, I came here. So actually, I'm based between Hong Kong and Vietnam, but since COVID, uh, I cannot really travel because uh, entry to Vietnam mm. is extremely hard. Um, and also we have, you know, quarantine period, so lots of time uh, would be wasted. So yeah, I'm, I'm mostly staying in Vietnam right now. So that's really was. The... But out of all places, why did you choose Vietnam? Out of I mean, you had like about four or five places you just named mm -hmm. off, right? Why Vietnam? It's uh, it's, it's it's very. I think it's it, it just a guess because I've been traveling in in Th in Thailand for a bit. Yeah, I was also in Vietnam for a bit. I was also in Indonesia, particularly Bali. Um, so, yeah, it's really one of the factors was that flights from Vietnam to Hong Kong and vice versa are very cheap. Um, Vietnam to Hong Kong is uh, also very quick, only a couple of hours. And since it's cheap, um, yeah, I can just pretty much do daily trips as well if I need to, if something urgent comes up. With Indonesia, it's much further. Um, Thailand, I like Vietnam more than Thailand. So it's just, you know, personal preference. And, you know, in the end, even if I don't like it, I would be, okay, um, let's go somewhere else. Um, so it's really, you know, it was kind of based on a couple of factors, but even if I don't get it right, I could easily, you know, okay. go somewhere else. Uh, makes sense. I haven't been to Vietnam though, but I've heard not so great things about there in terms of people getting cheated here and there, but this is what I hear. I don't really know what it's like though. Yeah, yeah. Ah, it's, 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 you know, it's, it's, it's whole Asia thing because so it's, it's true. Yes and no, because I think it's it's whole Asia thing because, you know, uh, Southeast Asia particularly, it, it's kind of poor countries, right? So whenever Westerners are coming there, you can easily make money um, from them, you know, especially from tourists because they're willing to pay. So usually that's where you get ripped off. Um, so if you know prices, uh, you know, you will not get ripped off. But I think it's it's not particularly Vietnam. It's, it's the same happens in Thailand. It's the same happened in China. So I think it's it's it just overall, you know, how how everything with tourism works. And uh, yeah, it's I think it's it just like that, you know, regarding all the stealing and, and stuff. I don't think here it's something really, you know, crime is that high, uh, particularly if you live, you know, in, in central areas. Um, if you go somewhere outside, maybe, but again you know it's um like people are very genuine what i like about vietnam it's it's really people i love vietnamese because they will always help you like if you for example don't know where to go uh you can ask them and they will even after they will tell you where to go they will actually can guide you to that place you know they insist to walk with you to that place it's like they're super helpful so yeah, th this is uh, this is very rare, I think, um, within people because yeah, it's I, th I think this whole poverty, you know, it's they're really down to down to earth, and um, I really love it. Yeah, I I, push, I noticed a lot of people in Asia are kind of like that. They kind of look at the oh, this is the dumb dumb white foreigner who's in a totally new place, mm -hmm. and we got to help him out or else he's gonna you know go down the wrong <laughs> alley or who knows what. Uh, and talking about the, the price, the price gouging. Yeah, I've had that quite a few times. And sometimes I kind of welcome it because uh, after some time I picked up Mandarin quite well. And so I would just change from English to Mandarin and then they would know, oh, this guy, I can't, I can't play with him. He knows what's going on. And so yeah. it was, uh, it's, it's, it's my own game back to them, right? But it's, business is a game, right? Exactly. And speaking of business, right? How, how do you conduct your business? Because I mean, do you have some clients out in Vietnam or do you have, I mean, like you said, you have some business out here too. So how do you kind of keep everything in track? So, yeah, um, regarding my own stuff, it's really, I don't really focus on Asian market because my price range is, it's quite high. Um, I think for even Asians, it doesn't make sense to hire me. So I'm really focusing on more Western, Western world. So mostly um, my clients are from America, Australia, or some even from Europe. But even for Europe, uh, my price range now can be slightly higher at, at, at a higher end. So it's really, you know, um, I don't really focus on Vietnam, uh, on, on, on Asia in particular, because yeah, it's, um, it's really for, 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 for the, the price aspect of things. But how does that work? Because I tried working with some people in the US and mm -hmm. actually seems that the best people I can get a hold of are like California, Utah, mm -hmm. this kind of area. 
East Coast is like really difficult to to catch up with. So yeah, it, it, you have people probably more on the West Coast, right? So yeah, it, it's very funny because the time zones. Yeah, it's a uh, it's very interesting. Um, it's very interesting game. For example, at one at one moment, I had uh, American client, Australian client, and European client. Three completely different time zones. So with America, I have twelve hour difference. With Europe, I have around five hour difference. Um, I'm ahead, and with Australia, it's around yeah. five hours behind. Um, so yeah, it's really. Mm. It just ends up, you know, with communication, how well you can communicate and how well you can synchronize your work. Because usually I don't have, you know, massive, massive, mm, you know, yeah. uh, sessions with, with my clients. So it's just wrap up calls uh, once, once in a while, once, twice a week. And when you have, you know, this, this particular time, it's, it, it's fine. For example, in, from my own side, I have around, so I'm, I'm talking local time, right? I would have around, 6 7 a.m call with with america which is around 5 6 p.m at their time uh, and then i have mm. afternoon uh, spent for uh for europeans because they start to work around 2 3 p.m my time and for australia again it's somewhere be, uh, between like 6 a.m to like 3 p.m because is there is their time of work so yeah in the end it's re it just really ends up with um with really communication because if you don't have that communication yeah it, it's really hard I, I can really tell it's really hard mm -hmm. and yeah this this situation is kind of unique yeah. you know within covering pretty much everything usually i have a couple of clients and mostly you know they're from from the same time zone so yeah, or, or it's like slight difference, so it's, it's not that bad. But yeah, I think the most problematic is America, of course, because you can end up, you know, 10, 14 hour difference. So it's like completely opposite. Um, but yeah, we just need to synchronize because it's, 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 it's not, you know, that bad. Like you can easily wake up at 3 a.m., 4 a.m., you know, to have a call. It, it's fine. You just synchronize your day and you go to bed, you know, at, at 8, at 7. Um, so it's again just communication and you can really handle that yeah i think it depends yeah like you said yourself and also the client itself because i i have one guy uh one kind of on and off client he uh some of the developers they're up like it's like 4 p.m hong kong time and they're still up doing stuff yeah. i don't know it must be probably 2 a.m their time or something but yeah it's it's amazing like it, you find some of these clients that have that kind of really weird schedule and it kind of works out um so uh, but but if, I want to talk a little bit about Vietnam, right? Like I mm -hmm. don't, I've never been there before, as I think I said. Mm -hmm. How is it in terms of development? Because people say Hong Kong's kind of behind, Singapore is kind of up and coming. They're doing more interesting tech. How about Vietnam? How are they doing? Seems like they're kind of having a little bit of a kind of a Silicon Valley or a tech explosion right now. No. So in terms in 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 tech space, I think yeah, it's uh, Vietnam mm -hmm. is exploding, uh, especially Ho Chi Minh. I'm not sure about Hanoi, but uh, Ho Chi Minh is really uh, more, you know, tech okay. hubs. And again, uh, it's really good here because it's very cheap, so you can launch startup very easily. I'm not sure about incorporation process, but I think if you go through some accelerator, it's it's, it's much easier. Uh, I have a couple of conferences here as well. Um, so yeah, tech space, it's, it's pretty good. Uh, again, you have uh, Grab here as well. Um, you have uh, for e-commerce Lazada. You have Tiki, so it's um, it's massive. It's, it's kind of uh, Amazon alter alternative, right? But for Vietnam, so yeah, it's um, they're doing great stuff. Um, I'm not sure they're up to you know, let's say Silicon Valley level in in terms of UIX. But again, this is this is what I learned um, living in Asia for so long that. Asians, you know, UI UX is very different from Western UI UX. I think it's pretty much a uh, whole user experience is driven by China because whenever you can actually see, you know, compare like e-commerce apps, uh, mostly in Asia, we look similar as Alibaba ones. And when you are in China, you know, dealing with many different apps, 
pretty much UX is almost the same. It's just different colors. Uh, uh, UI is almost the same. It's just different colors because people don't really want to introduce something new because introducing something new means that it's either will be approved or most likely rejected because people naturally don't want to change. And since they, they understand this pattern, they understand if I click here, let's say bottom sheet will come up and then I have some selections, I click and then it will go to the cart. I don't really want to disturb this kind of UX because it's very, very risky. So I think it's also, you know, um, different standards, uh, what, what it is, you know, developing, let's say mobile app in, in Asia and, and, and uh, Western. Uh, but yeah, tech, tech side, I think talents in Vietnam, uh, developers are quite strong. Um, so I was working with several uh, development houses when I when I had my own teams. Um, so we had some in Ukraine, in Belarus, uh, we had in Taiwan. Um, we didn't have anything in Vietnam. Uh, I know from Hong Kong, people also choose uh, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, I think. Uh, so yeah, my, my preference would be like really top is Vietnam and, and, and Taiwan. And then it would go, I think, um, Belarus and, uh, and Ukraine. So Belarus, Ukraine, usually rates are slightly higher. Um, for Taiwan, Vietnam is, it would be slightly less, uh, but you really play, you know, with, uh, I think with creativity because in Asia, uh, usually developers creativity level is lower than Western. Uh, so I think this is also very big, uh, you know, uh, justifier for, for the, for the price range. If you don't like, for instance, in Asia, you have to have really, really strong, um, product manager and project manager. If they can really translate the whole idea and, and can lead, you know, developers into, into the solution, it's really, it will be the machine. Um, it's insane. It will be unstoppable. You know, it's, um, it's dream team, but in, in Western world, it won't work in Western world. You have to give flexibility because developers will, will like to brainstorm. will like to bring their own ideas. You know, they won't agree with everything, what you, what you're saying. So it's, it's also management style completely differs, but when you understand this whole workflow, I think you can work with, with both of them. So. Yeah, since I'm Western, uh, even till this day for me, it's, it's slightly hard, you know, to work with. If I'm working in a team, you know, with Asian developers, it's, it's slightly harder. That's also, yeah, I, I find it, you know, much easier to work with, with Western clients because I was just raised in, in Western. You know, I have similar values, so it's just easier to work with. Yeah, I can see, I can see that. I totally understand what you're saying. Like most of my clients, I think all of them at this moment are all Western. It does make things easier to kind of discuss and similar thinking, everything like that. Uh, but going back to the tech scene in Vietnam, right? Mm -hmm. Is mm -hmm. there actually anybody using Flutter in Vietnam? I know it's it's pretty popular in China, but what about Vietnam? Yeah. So Flutter started, uh, I think, uh, people started to use Flutter in Vietnam more, I think, since 2020, middle, middle of 2020. Um, when I came to Vietnam, 2020, started 2020. I didn't see that many jobs actually in Flutter, but if I look now in, in, in jobs in Vietnam for Flutter, it's uh, maybe 100 X. Um, so the market is really expanding. And I think one of the reasons that, um, so one of the reasons is, is COVID. And since there is COVID, uh, remote work became much more popular. And then Western world is looking for cheaper labor and they're looking for more Asian countries, right? because uh, yeah, here is just cheaper. And Vietnam probably noticed, you know, this trend, especially in mobile development and Flutter, because Flutter is getting more and more popular every, every single day. It's one of the top repos uh, in, in popularity, like last month or last year. I, I don't remember the stat, but yeah, it's, it's getting more and more popular. So most likely, you know, Vietnamese business guys just noticed that, okay, this trend is raising and we can provide this, you know, services. So there are many, many development houses here, I think that are working for Western clients. And now it's just exploding during this, <clears throat> this whole, you know, remote, remote work. And I think that's, that's one of the reasons why it's really so many, you know, these Flutter developers here.
especially now it's crazy. So I have a question for you that's always up for debate, right? I don't know if you have any idea what my question is going to be, but this is kind of one of the big questions we have. In React Flutter. Native versus Flutter? No, no, <laughs> that's that's one. But I mean, obviously you chose Flutter, I think, if, or else you would have said, you know, you'll be using something else. But I think one of the biggest questions is, how do you manage your state? Yeah. And this is, this is the what big one. What do you use for state and, management? Uh, even, you know, it, it, yeah. So this is this is the big one. And even even the Flutter team, you know, doesn't have a straightforward answer. Um, there are many, many different uh, state management methods. So provide your block, I think, is the top, then Redux. Then you have uh, River Pods and much more. Uh, but I think top ones are really provider and, and a block. Uh, for me personally, I use provider, so I have my own pattern. Mm -hmm. I go with that. Um, I think my proposal, my proposal is really for MVP provider is is uh, is a must. Uh, it's much easier, you know, to handle than than the block. Uh, but block is really good for enterprise kind of apps because it's really extremely clear separation of concerns and mm -hmm. it's much easier, you know, to 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 write tests and everything. Um, the downside, I think, of provider upside and downside, I think, is the is the same thing that it's easy. Um, since it's easy, you can use it very easily everywhere. But since you're using everywhere, you might mess up, you know, all all state management. So you really need to force yourself to decouple. While with block, uh, it's kind of in built and this kind of decoupling. So that's why it's easier. But for a block learning curve, it's much much harder. So it's really, um, yeah, it's it's uh, it's pros and cons everywhere, and there's no single answer. And I, uh, yeah, I had I had a quick chat, you know, with um, with Tim Snet. Uh, he's um, he's one of the managers in in, in Flutter team. Um, we were chatting also about this whole state management and maybe you know to build some MVPs around it to really show the community, you know, that. You can do it like this, you can do it like that. It's really up to your choice and you know how, how everything works together with the different mm -hmm. patterns. Maybe there are very clear pros and cons you know, of, of, of one of, uh, or another. So yeah, it's, it's, it's what you said. It's, it's really debatable and it's no single answer that fits all. I mean, why do you think this is such a controversial topic and that Flutter Desk cannot say, okay, this is what we're going to use or this is what we're going to use? I mean, do you have any idea why this is like this? Do you have any, at least any feeling about this? It's because Flutter is so flexible. Uh, mm -hmm. It's really this flexibility and, and being dynamic uh, introduced all of that uh, because in Android, it's, it just recommended ways how you do the, how you do this. And if you follow it, it's really, you have killer architecture. But in Flutter, since it's so dynamic and, you know, even the same UI you can write in a million different ways, literally. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so again, the state management, again, it falls into the same category that it's just so many ways. How can you update, you know, pages and how can you update states? So I think that's, that's really, it, it was a, it was a really good upside, but I think it's also a downside. I remember a year or two years ago, I, I also wrote an article about Flutter that, you know, I really hate that it's really so dynamic because when you let's say if you're a development house or even if you if you're if you have your own company and you have flutter developers mm. when you hire a new flutter developer he not necessarily will know what you're doing because it's so many different ways how can you do stuff so it's really the onboarding process will get uh, gets you know much more much longer and might be much much more complicated because it's it's not even 50 50 percent that yeah. you know the guy will know what they're doing. Usually, yeah, it will be provider or, or, or blog, but even with, with the provider or blog, it's so many different ways for UI and UX to work. So, yeah, it's um, it's kind of controversial, but uh, yeah, um, this is what it is. And I, I, I don't think, you know, it, it will improve. I think it just within the time, we'll just have more examples, maybe more sophisticated ones that we could really follow, you know, and uh, and, and that's about it. Yeah, I mean, I guess that is kind of a good and a bad thing, right? That at least you have some flexibility about what you want to use and what makes sense to you. 
And it also lets the community also come up with things uh, that, you know, could be even better, right? Like, have you ever used the Git X stuff before? Like the Git it? I, I use Git it no. with a block. With, actually, I oh, use yeah, Git it yeah. with block. So, yeah. so get it then. Yeah, I used Git it with block, and I thought that was really wonderful because I was able to like test very easily because you could just use the Git it to grab stuff and, and change things around. That was uh, a lot of fun. But when you use Flutter, right? Do you also find yourself able yeah? So get it. It's it's really one of the one of the easy easier mm -hmm. ways. Sorry, Alan. Oh, I was gonna say when you use uh, Flutter after some time, do you start to actually see other apps that are using Flutter just by looking at the UI? Uh, yeah, it's actually. I think right now it's quite hard to distinguish. Let's say if you download the app. Mm -hmm. um, this app is native or it's uh, react native or it's flutter i think it's easier to distinguish if it's react native uh, than native but uh, differentiation between flutter and, and and native i think it's very hard because even the ui elements are just so similar and the ux wise is very similar there is one particular issue right now at, at this particular moment for ios animations that uh, at some point it's it just very clunky mm -hmm. Um, but Flutter team is aware of that, and they are working on, on on a fix. But I think this is the one of the areas, you know, the rendering wise on iOS. You probably can, um, you probably can identify that. Um, but besides that, I think it's it's very hard. And I think this is this is also one of the things that since it's very hard to identify, you know, um, if if the company is using native or or Flutter or React Native, and what's the purpose of, of of going, you know, for the native side? Because you end up paying twice, or even more, and end up spending two x or more amount of time on development. I think it's really the selection, you know, you go cross functional or native, it really adopts. I think from the idea perspective mm -hmm. that if you go, if you want to go native, I think you really have to deal something with hardware. So Wi-Fi, audio, you know, maybe hardcore video, um, Bluetooth, um, because yeah, uh, Flutter it's it doesn't take that part that well, especially Bluetooth. So you still need to go, you know, and, and drill down uh, in in a native layer about the Bluetooth, for example. But if you if you don't don't drill down, you know, in, in the hardware, and you're building something outside of that then I think native is, is real um, a way to go. And again, this is up to up to the person, um, React Native or Flutter. I have my favorite. Uh, I know why Flutter is better than, than React Native, but again, you know, it, uh, for React Native, it's just so, mu so many more developers out there. And mm -hmm. it's more proven because it's been there for longer. So usually business people just will look into, into this, this aspect. Usually if, if there is some tech people behind it, then they might evaluate, you know, the, the trends and go deeper into insights. Um, because Flutter is actually still betting, you know, on, on the future. It's, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, again, it's, it's, uh, it's upside and downside that Flutter is by Google, um, because Google likes to kill products. Um, yeah. So it's, it's really, yeah. Uh, uh, even though it's uh, it's three years for Flutter uh, maturity, but everything can happen. So, do you think that Google would ever kill Flutter? Uh, um, looking at uh, looking at this particular moment now, because it is getting too strong. Because the vision from Google side about Flutter, it's really one one language one framework for everything because again flutter is not a language flutter is a framework and the language is dart dart is amazing and again for now you can have the same the same flutter working on mobile on web on a desktop for windows and mac and linux if i remember correctly and i think in the future it will be auto and tv so it's it's literally amazing and especially right now you already can build you know with the same code base 
mobile app, website, and desktop app. So in, in one of the projects I was building the Mac app, it's, it's really amazing. It's, it's such a, uh, such a lifesaver. It's, it's insane. So I think only this aspect, it, it would be just hard to kill a flutter, to kill flutter. So I don't really think that, you know, uh, it will die. Everything can happen again. Maybe Facebook, you know, releases something, some, you know, react native on steroids with some similar vision. Um, yeah. Not sure. Do you think that React Native people are starting to take a look at Flutter too, and maybe will consider to start to switch over? Ah, this is actually very interesting. If I was React Native developer, which I'm not, but if I was, mm. I don't think I would look into into Flutter. I think it's if I already build you know a significant significant amount of technical expertise in React Native. I don't think I, I need to invest my time in a Flutter. I think now, because maybe in a couple of years, uh, when you know the trend of of uh, of React Native uh, might die, like when you see decline in a trend of React Native, maybe then there is a good indication now that okay, maybe there is a time to to to, to switch uh, the framework which I'm working on, because again, this is this is kind of uh, opportunity cost and if I spend you know five years in React Native to achieve the same the same level in Flutter, I'll need several years. Uh, can I really sacrifice several years, or I can continue you know getting better on React Native for a couple of years and earn you know sick amount of sick amount of money? Um, so it's again it's uh, it's pros and cons. Of course, you can you know have a look into Flutter. Uh, you can play with it, but to really you know be in Flutter's eco, you really have to build stuff. Because that's also actually I can share one of the observations from my side. Um, if if the developer is like let's say if the person has ten plus years of development experience, let's say native IS, right? And they switch to Flutter. So it's still you'll be Flutter Junior because it's just fundamentally different how everything works. It's the same if you're ten years of Android and you switch to Flutter. So it's you can clearly see in the code that the person, you know, they have very, very good technical skills. Like they have tons of experience and how they are building the app, how they are decoupling the app, how they are modeling their app, you know, the whole model structure. It's really screams that the person has experience. But from, from Flutter side, how, you know, state management works and how things are put in together, it just, you can look into it and, and, and think, you know, what the hell, you know, is this other person wrote this? Because again, Flutter is, is just so different from from these native um, from native languages. And I think, yeah, this is this is also the thing. And of course, you know, for mobile to catch up with Flutter, it will be also easier than for a person coming from web because I think of, of even the naming is quite similar especially if you go from Android to Flutter, because it's, it's the Google. Um, but again, there is, there is quite, quite a learning curve because you're stepping, you know, if, if you are in, 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 in Android, you're stepping from Kotlin or Java to Dart. If you're in iOS, you're stepping from C or Swift to Dart. So you also need to understand how Dart works. And, you know, there are tons of uh, tips and tricks on Dart, on Dart um, list management and et cetera extensions um yeah lots lots of different stuff and especially right now i'm not safety so yeah what do you think about the state of education in florida though because you know uh obviously you and i at one point were both beginners in this i mean the, the way i learned flutter was i took a book from prag prog i went through the whole thing and then i started building a client app and then or two client apps at, at about the same time <laughs> and uh i would say with any language or any kind of framework, it's st you still need, even after you build something, you still need some time because of course you're gonna make some mistakes and you have to kind of go back and change it though. But what do you think about the save education flutter considering that we both kind of think that things move quite quickly? Mm -hmm. How do you kind of keep up and all that? 
you just need to keep building stuff, man. I need to have some, you know, <laughs> some people to follow. Um, they're always share what's 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 happening. You know, it's it's hard to it's hard to come up. It's hard to follow Flutter, yeah, because it's it's just so much new stuff happening all the time. But at the same aspect, you know, it's hard to keep up, but it's growing so fast. So it's uh, you know, it's um, it's pros and cons at that end and. It's the same what what you said, you know, the learning of Flutter. I think it's again, it's you you need to build stuff, continuously build, because I remember my my first project as well. It was just horrible, and for for example, my my own rent me right the, the startup. So first I built on on native because I I just I, I wasn't confident with Flutter, how to deal with with state management at that point because it was still quite unclear. And then I wrote everything from Android to Flutter. And I think after several months, I wrote again from Flutter to improve Flutter because when I made this first iteration, it was just horrible. And now if I look into in, into the code, you know, it's, um, I think I would rewrite again because it's it's just so different, you know, and and things are changing, and uh, you, you you're just becoming smarter. Uh, the more the more you build, the more time you spend. So, yeah, it's uh, it's it's very interesting, and I think it's uh, it generally not not only Flutter. It's it's any any language you work on, you know. And when you reflect on your old code, if you open project you now from one week, uh, uh, not one week, one year ago, you just think, what the hell is that? It's, I think I think it's very natural. Well, I think people always say this. I've heard many times is that if you ever go back to your code after some period of time and you don't kind of say, what was I thinking or who wrote this crap, then you know that you haven't improved, right? Yeah, yeah exactly. It's kind of uh, <laughs> almost like the WTFs per minute kind of thing that I can think of. Uh, but like, do you have any tips for people who are just beginning about kind of like how can they wrap their mind around this? I, I joined quite a few Facebook groups and I can see a lot of people are falling they're similar categories, right? They're not able to understand Dart. They're not able to understand how do we do this? How do you do that? And it seems like they're all, or not they're all, but quite a few are also like, okay, how can I build an API in Django, an app in Flutter and use my SQL to do this task? Like, do you have any kind of tips that kind of help people out? You have to start. Just first thing, stop reading and start. Because um, if you keep reading stuff, the information will not flow into your head uh, sufficiently as if you're building stuff and then you, you face issues and then you need to start Googling how to solve it. Because development, you know, it, it's extremely unique. The same, the same problem can be solved in many different ways. There is no single answer for everything. Every single developer have their own point of view and their own thinking mechanics. So again, it's just so many different ways. How can one problem be solved? So even though you pick up the book, it it not necessarily you know. Even though it's top one, you know, bestseller, whatever, clean architecture. Yes, you can take examples from that, but I think person has to be you know. It has to follow his own you know thinking mechanism. You cannot really force mm -hmm. something on top of on on top of that because I think you do what you do the best uh, in in a sense you know so it has to just come naturally because again developer not everyone can be developer um, not everyone can stay on on an issue and spend five six eight hours uh, just to realize that semicolon is missing for example. Or there was some simple, you know, misspelling. Um, that's very frustrating, and that's why you know, especially nowadays, when people don't really take challenges, they really the, the uh, how how it's called. Um, damn it! Uh, time span, not not time span. When people cannot focus on on one thing long enough, right? So let's say. Yeah, you know this, this stuff. I really forgot how it's called. So it's um, yeah, it's like a dedication or or staying focused, basically, right? Kind of, yeah. Because yeah, it's like I work tons of hours. Like I do sixty to eighty hours a week, 
And when I when I start some new stuff, I'll be spending you know hours on extremely simple simple things, and it's extremely fr frustrating, you know. Uh, but I know I'll get better, and I always do. So it it's really you know this just kind of mindset you you have to have that it's really hard, and. Mm -hmm. Yeah, not not everyone can be a developer. That's that's for sure. And and getting back to your question, any tips? It, it's really just start building stuff. Um, try to find some some bigger projects, um, and just check you know uh, you know the code, the open source projects. Check the code, how people are doing stuff. Try to you know have some examples. Maybe yeah. try to you know get some uh, top flutter you know influencers in a sense. Um, follow their YouTube, follow, uh, follow official uh, Flutter channels. Like Flutter, boring uh, uh, is putting quite quite some good content. The boring so, show. Yeah, yeah, the boring show. They they put yeah the boring they, show. They put qu content quite quite a bit. Um, mm. So it's really yeah, it, it's lots of stuff. Um, you can spend hours only on listening and watching. So I think you really need to prioritize your time. You cannot always just listen and, and, and read and watch. You need to do stuff. So I think that's that's really the only way to, to go to go forward. Yeah, I think that's that's very true. And I also really, really agree with uh, your comment about not everybody can code. Uh, I agree that it takes a really good, a unique mindset, uh, at least to be good, right? Maybe you can kind of get your way around, but you got to have the mindset and you got to be able, like you said, to sit there and Bust ass or keep working on the same problem and just get it all done. It's not. It's not easy. I, I totally agree with you. I, I once had one guy. I think I convinced him to not be a developer anymore because somehow he managed to touch every single file in like a hundred file repo by just. I don't know. I forgot what I asked him to do. Something very simple. I asked him just to touch one file to do something, but like a hundred files were somehow touched and they all looked exactly the same when I did a git diff. Between the two, I couldn't tell what happened, so I just took the guy aside and said, "Listen, uh, I think you should go home. I think you should probably quit." And uh, I think he thought about it. And the next day. He did quit his internship, so I, I feel bad thinking about it right now. But at the same time, you know, there, I, like I said, I agree with what you're saying. There's some people who just, you know, it's not for them. Maybe he needs more training. I don't know, but actually, I think he's still doing tech right now, to be honest. Uh, but, but. Getting back to, there is one more question I wanted to ask because my initial thoughts about kind of hybrid approach is that initially you can do a hybrid approach, but in order to have a really great app, you have to actually go native at some point. Mm -hmm. Now that we have Flutter, I don't actually believe so much in that because it's still basically native. I mean, you could drop down to Swift, you can drop down to Kotlin, Java, whatever at any moment. Um, but I am curious because you went from native to Flutter, right? What was the reasoning for that? And also, do you ever see yourself ever maybe going back to native or do you ever do sometimes do a native Android app? So this is a great question. And from my own point of view, I, I don't really consider going back to native um, because I, it's just so much faster. Mm -hmm. So the one thing, you just faster to build on Flutter, especially animations, uh, UI, it's really fast. It's comparing with Android, it's much faster. Uh, I'm not sure if it's Swift. I'm I'm not native Swift developer. I have some some months in. in I've spent some months in Swift, but again, I'm I'm not I'm not a pro or even intermediate. But uh, yeah, from from tech perspective, I, I I don't really see myself going back to native. The only way that I I go back to native is really when when you need some native components in in Flutter. For instance, if you're dealing again with audio or Bluetooth or whatever. Then you just have bridging with native. So then you need to code in, in native. That's the only 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 way you know I get exposure to, to native platform. Besides that, no. Uh, from business perspective, it's again it also doesn't make sense most of the time to go native because in the beginning it's it's pretty much you'll you'll be spending twice either money or, or time, right? Because you have to hire two people. Uh, so one Android native, one iOS native, or one person which does Android and iOS native, but that person will spend twice uh, amount of time, right? But this is only in the beginning. 
because you will have most likely the backend side and backend side will have APIs. And then you constantly need to align between Android and iOS uh, how, how things are working. You need to align UX how things are working. You need to align UI how things are represented. And when the platform is getting bigger and bigger, these alignments will get longer and longer, which means more time will need to be spent, which means more money will need to be spent. So from business perspective, um, it truly doesn't make any, any sense. So React Native, I think, was just really such a budget friendly option, even though, you know, you can really understand the app is React Native. It's shit in a, in a better beginning. Um, now it's much better, of course. But in the beginning, you know, even though you can understand that it's not that good, but for MVPs, it's just way to go because it's so much faster. Even though it doesn't look that good, you still can prove, you know, you, the, the business value around it. Um, mm. So it, it's really just, it, it's again, it's just my point of view. And um, I only, I only see, you know, cross-functional language, cross-functional framework, you know, uh, a way to go if you don't have these specific, you know, business, um, business requirements, the drilling hardware in this in this time yeah I, I think that's some good points right uh i am watching another company so we, we we did some work for them but they're doing their own apps so it was one guy who does android one guy who does uh, ios and it's amazing how like you have one bug here and not a bug there and then one guy's moving faster than the other one and some this guy needs help and it's yeah, I did. I did recommend them Flutter, but they were already like, "Hey, we we we're already native, you know, and and we specialize in this, and we specialize in that, and it would be some time to catch up to speed." And I think at least one of them did have Xamarin before, and he got a bad taste in his mouth from it. So he's kind of like, "No, no more, no more uh, cross apps, okay." Um, but yeah, oh, man, yeah, we'll like... we'll see, right? We'll see. What it's it's so many stories like exactly the same that people are working native mm -hmm. you try to tell them to use uh, react native or or flutter and they just said oh i use seminar and it was garbage i don't want to use anything like this anymore <laughs> you know it's yeah i had several myself and it's it's so true and it's the same thing you know with with bugs um when you have native again it's uh, if it's a if it's the same person usually you will not have uh, the bug on one platform, but have on another because it's the same a thought process you're going through. But if it's different people, as I mentioned before, everyone has their own understanding how how things should be working, and you know have their own thought process. So you can very easily have one uh, bug, you know, on Android, but don't have on iOS or X or vice versa. So yeah, these these things are also very very frustrating. And in Flutter, again, you will just have a bug, fix it, and it's fixed on both platforms. Um, speed, just speed. Yeah, I would say 99% of the time, that's very true. I have had sometimes there's bugs in Android or iOS in particular for stupid reasons. Usually it's because we have to use something native. Like for one app, we have iOS health. And then for the other one, we have Google Fit. And, you know, if mm -hmm. you don't do something properly for one of the two or, or, or something really weird or, you know, with, with Android, you have weird types of screen sizes and shapes and shit. So it's... Mm -hmm. Anyways, but yeah, I, I, I agree. Yeah, ninety percent of the time, it's going to be about the same. So that's that's kind of the nice part. Um, but you know what? We've been talking so much about so many things. But I, I think this topic should be hopefully pretty quick. But at the same time, feel free to elaborate. What we really came here was yeah. all about was Firebase, right? So let me just kind of give some feedback about my experience yeah. with Firebase. Was that it was painful, right? I, I come from a background of, you know, you have an API, and then from there you can kind of it's easily to migrate your data, right? Because your 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 interface stays the same, but your internals can change, and that's okay, right? But for Firebase, mm -hmm. when mm -hmm. I was using it, we just used Firebase directly from the Android app, and uh, mm -hmm. sorry, from the from the Flutter app, and we wanted to do some changes with how we did data, and yeah, I, I just don't know a good good way to to change the data. Uh, format and also still keep things kind of running smoothly for previous apps because you know people just don't like to update their apps mm -hmm. and that's mm -hmm. that just happens or they wait for the app yeah. to be yeah. updated by itself when you're sleeping right 
And, and I believe you said you know how to do this, so I'd love to hear more. And people, I'm sure, would also love to hear more. I also know I'm not the only one who has the same problem, right? The same grievance, yeah. because I talk to yeah. other people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so it's very funny. So first thing, again, you're mixing Firebase and Firestore. <laughs> so let, let's just start from the beginning. So Firebase. I think, I think everybody does the same thing. Yeah, Firebase. Firebase uh -huh. is, is a product from, from Google. It was acquired uh, years ago from, I think it was a standalone startup and Google acquired it. And Firebase is, is really toolbox. And it has lots of, lots of different, um, different, let's say mini products. Uh, so it's authentication, remote config, Firestore, um, uh, real-time database, analytics, etc. right? So this is Firebase. And what we are talking about is Firestore. So Firestore is a database, no SQL database. And what you said is exactly true that no SQL, uh, nothing is, is linked with anything. When you have MySQL, right, you have tables and you can set relationships. Um, user can have car, right? So user will have car object, but, and every, every single entity of user will have a car, right? So it's, uh, it will be either null or I don't know, whatever, whatever your schema is. When you go to Firebase, uh, user can have a car as an object but also that car can not even exist because every single every single you know uh, document is standalone document so in firebase you can think of uh, you have collections and you have documents so collection is uh, is a table kind of and the ta and the document is actually the entity within that uh, within that table so yeah no sql no relationships and the data migration is is a pain yes um, you have to apply completely different strategy completely different mindset when dealing with nosql it takes lots of time uh, right now i'm jumping uh, between you know so i was working before with rest apis so it's mysql and then i jumped into firestore it was painful but then i really started to work really well with firestore uh, like data modeling and stuff because data modeling it's um you really need to spend lots of lots of time. Um, uh, so I, I can share about this a little more, but yeah. So I, I went to Firestore, NoSQL, and right now I'm dealing again with, with MySQL. So actually now to switch back to MySQL, it's just so hard to understand all of these relationships and how to model data. It's actually much easier, but uh, for now, actually I, I prefer NoSQL. Um, so the main difference is that the speed since there is no relationships, the execution speed is extremely fast, like milliseconds. So when you when you deal with the app in uh, having you know Firestore database, you cannot even see any loading anywhere because it's it's pretty much immediate. Everything happens immediately, pretty much like zero point x seconds, right? So this is this is the um, the upside of uh, of NoSQL. The downside, like how how do you choose between NoSQL or MySQL? Uh, because uh, again, there is no single answer, but usually you will go to my uh, with MySQL if you have complex queries, because since there is no uh, no relations, it's quite hard to query data in in, in Firestore. Uh, but again, Firestore has Algolia, uh, so we can go to use Algolia service. Everything is uh, linked, I think, real time, uh, synced real time. So it's also uh, the solution. But getting back to your question, um, how to migrate data? To, so there are different strategies. Um, the, the very first one, you have to have just different environments. Um, so one is the one is production, right? Because uh, you really cannot allow yourself to, uh, to have app in release and model your data in, in production because you can very easily delete, delete a field in NoSQL and your app might crash. Because again, uh, if you delete uh, one field, like user has an age, right? So if you delete age in MySQL, every single user age will be deleted. But if you delete age in uh, in NoSQL, only from that particular document age will be deleted. Other users will still have age uh, as a field. So yeah, this is this is really the case. And then you really have to start working with um, cloud functions. 
And with cloud functions, you really have to utilize them that whenever happens some update, you really want that um, particular thing to happen everywhere. So for example, in this particular case, um, if you want to get rid of you know age, you just would write cloud function that um, on this particular um, field deleted, for example, you just delete, you have to query pretty much whole Firestore database and find field age in user and just delete it. So it's really, you have to utilize yourself the cloud function. It might sound, you know, hard, but once you deal, again, once you deal with, uh, with NoSQL, it's, it's getting easier and easier with every step. Um, the data, if you want to change, let's say, age and you, you want to call it like, uh, I don't know, H2, I don't know, I'm not creative. <laughs> so you want to you wanna change from H to H2, right? So you just literally just... Uh... Well, here, here's your question. Here's a, let me give you a good, let me give you an example. Let's say, let me give you a really good example. Let's say that you have a name field where people put their mm -hmm. first and last name. And then what you want to do now is you want to separate first name yeah. and last name, right? And you want to just get rid of the name field. So how would you accomplish this kind of task? Because you're you're taking a piece mm -hmm. of data, you're changing it, and now you're separating mm -hmm. two pieces. So how would you handle this kind of thing with, you got people who are mm -hmm. currently using the app and haven't upgraded or mm -hmm. won't upgrade, and people who want to use a new version of the app, and then they have to have mm -hmm. data in sync. Yeah, so getting getting back to that uh, scenario. So again, we have a user, we have a name, uh, and in, in this particular version, in the name, we have um, Orima as the Manta thread. And in the future, you want to have first name Orimas, last name Demantas, right? Yeah. That's the right use case. And then get rid of the whole name thing. Yeah. Yeah. So what what should happen? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what what happens here? It's really you have to write cloud function. So within cloud function, you have to have your own logic uh, for creating new fields, name and uh, first name and last name. So it. It's, it's pretty simple in this case. Uh, you would have Orima's Demanta, so it's uh, split by, by space. So you just write a function that first string would go into first name, second string would go into last name. So first, this this part, right? Uh, when you write that cloud function, you execute it. Uh, so this is kind of uh, one time. Uh, you can write HTTP function, doesn't matter. All you need to do is just to, to have some kind of function so you really can populate these first name and last name methods, right? Mm -hmm. So that's the very first step. So when you execute that, uh, you will populate first name and last name. So the first step is, is already executed. Then in your in your app, uh, you want to you want to start using these these methods, right? Uh, these fields. So very first thing you should never delete name so name will be deleted after maybe half a year maybe after three years it depends mm -hmm. on your you know uh, on your deprecation strategy and how do you update the app because you can force update the app uh you can because when when you update for example android app when you push updates you can set the priority all right so i think it's from one to five um, because sometimes when you push update to android uh, that update will not get distributed immediately but if you set priority high it will be executed you know immediately uh, you can also have again the force um, the force update and you can actually toggle that force uh, within remote config so in this particular case we want to have force uh, force update but we also want to set a flag that if we do this field change we want people for we force people to update because we know otherwise app will crash right so we are, if we are executing this kind of step, uh, then we can actually wait for a month or whatever period it is. Maybe you have analytics, and then you will be able to remove, you know, this uh, this name field. And in the code, uh, simply for the new version, you just completely deprecate the name and you switch for first name and last name because whenever a person updates the app, they will go for first name and last name. So this is very simple deprecation strategy. Um, if you don't have the force update flag anywhere. Uh, it's more tricky because you would you would have to maintain that name field for as long as at least one person has the app, you know, on all the version. 
because it, it works exactly the same the same way you know as with um, MySQL because if you change uh, some table name or uh, some you know entity name it's really all app will crash because you just don't have that particular new field in your old app so this is this is exactly the same handling as with MySQL but I think the the main the main the main question was how to really populate these new fields because yeah in mysql you just simply enter first name and last name so it will be populated into every single uh user but with nosql you have to write cloud function for that but again once you deal more with mysql then you'll just have generic functions for example adding new field removing existing field updating field to something else for example, if if you don't if you don't want to have you know first name, uh, you only you you don't want to have you know last name, you want to have family name. So you just would have another cloud function that just change that queries every single user in in a, in a database, uh, gets the last name and updates it to family name. So that's that's really um, uh, how, how it works. And again the when you are just starting with that, it might seem like very hard. But once you are, you know, spending more time with that, you already have these generic generic functions. So you just execute them, and it's uh, it's easy. Um, I think in the future, one improvement can actually be made that these generic functions could be just immediately written by by Firebase team, because again, uh, if if you Google, you know how to update field in Firestore, how to delete field in Firestore, you know, how to add new field to Firestore. Uh, you will find lots of lots of answers and people share, you know, their own, um, their own functions, how they do that. Um, and it's pretty much the same, every single, you know, every single comment. It just, you know, again, how, how developer thinks it's uh, one, one thing can be, can be slightly different than other, but uh, the end result is exactly the same. So that's really, uh, no skill in a nutshell. Um, One part I'm not so clear on, right, is so if you do update your own profile and you say, okay, my name mm -hmm. is, and you update it, and then the new app says my first name is, my last name <laughs> is, you still have to back back that, right? Is that also yeah. a cloud function to kind of sync things back and forth? Yes. So, so yeah, this is, this is actually I wanted to cover as well. So what would happen that mm -hmm. in, in a real app, uh, you have user, and if you if you're able to, so let's say you have an app, you have a user, and it's a chat app, right? So we are chatting together. We have some chat messages, and when I open that particular window, I query that user, and I see your name, right? And if you change your name, it will change your username, and that username has to be changed everywhere, in every single document where the user is, right? So this is also the, the cloud function. So within Firestore, you can have on delete, on create it, and on modify cloud functions. So in this case, it would be on modify or on change. I, I, I don't really remember, but it's the same purpose. So uh, in this particular scenario that you go into your profile, you change your, let's say, first name. And the cloud function would be triggered that user changed their, um, their name. And then you have to write uh, the function that you have to query every single record, uh, every single document mm. from the database, and override, uh, update that you know first name to your first name. That's it. So this is this is really comes back to uh, the Firestore uh, charging model, because you're getting charged for reads, writes, and deletes. Right? Um, reads are cheap. Uh, mm -hmm. Reads are cheapest, I think. <clears throat> Writes are more expensive, and, and deletes, I don't remember. I think is the most expensive. Um, because the scenario can be when, when you go to the chat, uh, you can query that user object, right? So then with this, with this particular model, you would have hundreds of reads. But then you don't need to change anything, you know, in, in many places. But if you're dealing with the data duplication, then the reads would would get significantly less. And you know, this is again, this is really no scale thing that 
you have to duplicate your data as much as possible. I'm not sure if it's as much as possible, but you have to duplicate data because there is no relationships. Yeah. So if there is a chat app, you would have a field message, message text, create it at, let's say, date, timestamp, and then username, um, and maybe something else. So that actually username, uh, and you would have user ID, of course, because you have to link somehow. So yeah, it's, it's really that username would have to change based on user ID. And that cloud function would actually find every single message from that user ID in, in chat and would change username to your new username. That's how it works. Okay. Um, I think I understand how it all works. It seems very similar to how you would do anyways in a backend where you have to still kind of keep things up to date or, or you can split them or combine them on the fly, depending upon how you want to do it. All right. I, I know you told yeah, me before it's, it's, you're a pretty really... busy guy. We actually went over our time. Mm -hmm. As I said, we went mm -hmm. over our time that we, we promised. I didn't want to take more than an hour of your time and I, I'm taking too much. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> maybe we can come back to this topic a little bit later. Um, but yeah, I really thank you for, for, sure, for being here. Uh, I don't want to. I don't want to totally cut you off. Like, is there anything that you wanted to to mention before uh, we, we end this session? Um, yeah. So first, uh, really appreciate you know you're you're having me here. I'm super happy you know to share about about Flutter. I'm super enthusiastic about Flutter. I'm very bullish on Flutter. So yeah, it's um, I think it's the future for uh, cross functional um, programming especially mobile and yes mm. the, i think the, the main takeaway you know in our this topic because it should have been you know more of uh, more of the firestore and flutter so i think in, in in this sense it's really there is a uh, quite a big learning curve and there is no single answer you should use no SQL or, or mysql and you know it's um i think just just give it a try uh, there are so many resources available, you know, for, for learning uh, Firebase, uh, Firestore. Yeah. See, I'm mixing myself. Uh, <laughs> and yeah, just go for it. And it's the same with Flutter. You know, if, if you if you haven't started uh, with Flutter, just give it a try. Start Starting in Flutter is extremely easy, like super, super easy. Mm -hmm. It just, you know, it, it will just get the exponential curve because starting is very easy. Then after a month, you realize, oh, shit, I need to learn much more. So then it will, you know, drop, but then eventually it will uh, raise again. So it's a, uh, it's, it's very interesting experience, but to start with Flutter is extremely easy and just give it a try, try to understand, you know, how, how it works, um, how UI renders and because it's, it's so much easier and most important, it's so much faster than the native development. So that's, I think my, it would be my, my takeaway. Okay. No, I, I totally agree. Um, so sadly, we're gonna have to wrap up. Uh, again, if you want to come back, just reach out to me. You have my scheduling thing. We could schedule another one. Uh, I don't mind. So sure. Thanks for stopping by. Uh, again, glad to have you on. Hope you come back soon. Awesome. So see you. Thank you very much, man. I appreciate right. it. Bye bye.